Welcome to the Good Growing Podcast. I am Chris Enroth, horticulture educator with University of Illinois Extension, coming at you from Macomb, Illinois, and we have got a question and answer show for you today. Bugs in the garden, who's around? Well, I'll tell you, there's quite a few right now. So, uh, you know, I can't do this alone. I am joined, as always, by our co-host, uh, horticulture educator, Ken Johnson in Jacksonville. Hey, Ken. Hello, Chris. It's kind of weird going first with the interactions. I, I know. Um, if uh, listeners are aware, we're missing. We're down one person. And um, so Katie Parker, she was past tense, local foods, small farms educator here with U of I Extension. She has moved on to greener pastures, which is a horrible way of saying she got a new job. But but. But yeah, that almost sounds like, yeah, she like died or something, but no, she's, <laughs> she got a new job, a better job. She's going to be making a lot more money. So than Ken or I, so, oh yeah. So Katie, we wish you well, and we really miss you as um, our, our social lubricant here. Ken, what are we, yes. what are we going to do? I don't know. Lots of awkward <laughs> silences so, now. <laughs> yeah, I know. I don't um, know how to talk to this guy very much. So uh, yeah, um, we'll just, uh uh talk about gardening we'll do that how's that sound there we go sounds like a plan sounds good okay well in terms of what's happening right now in the gardening world we have quite a bit i mean we are in full gear harvest um full gear like scouting looking for problems um pulling weeds like crazy watering like mad and then insects they're showing up in droves. I mean, I'm seeing them all over the place. Um, and we have several questions that have come in regarding these insects. And so, Ken, this being your, your favorite topic, I'll <laughs> kick this off to you real quick with the question, which I think you, I, every extension person, we have our own little spiel that we've memorized about this particular insect, the Japanese beetle. Um, so I'm getting varied questions from across the areas that I'm serving, the counties that uh, I'm located, and it is, it really starts this way. Japanese beetles were here and they were really bad, and then they got better, and now they're bad again. Are they going to get better again? And what can I do? Because I have Japanese beetles everywhere now. So Ken, what are we supposed to be doing right now with these uh, Japanese beetles that are starting to show up and eat everything? Yeah, I've been hearing the same thing. Um, people saying they've, they're seeing a lot more Japanese beetles this year than they have in the last uh, few years. So at least here in Jacksonville, they've been out for several weeks now. Um, one of the kind of best ways to prevent issues with them is to go out and get them off your plants when they first start showing up. The better job you do of controlling them early in the year, early in the season when they're showing up, the more success you're going to have long term. Uh, with them coming to your plants because as they start feeding they'll damage the plants those damage those damaged plants will release chemicals that's going to attract more beetles which causes more damage and it just kind of balloons after that so typically if you do a good job keeping beetles off your plants for the first several weeks typically you have less damage down the line and that can be going out hand picking if you've only got a few plants that are going to be affected go out early in the morning <clears throat> uh, when they're not all that active you, when they disturb, they'll drop to the ground. So you get a bucket of water, put some soap in there. Uh, the soap's not going to do it, not going to kill them. That's just to break the surface tension so they sink um, and just tap them in there. You can, if you don't want to touch them, you can throw them in there. Pay your kid or grandkid or neighborhood kid five cents a beetle, a penny a beetle, depending on how many you have or how gullible they are, um, and do it that way. Uh, you can use uh, pesticides. So carbaryl is one that's commonly used. There's others. Um, you can use as well. You just want to be careful if they're on blooming plants. More and more you're seeing pesticide labels saying don't apply to plants in bloom. Um, so if, if you can, according to the label, apply it to plants in bloom, do that in the evening. When we're not going to have pollinators out, so you're not affecting them. Uh, things like that. If you have high value plants, you can cover those with a netting. So roses or something like that. Um, just make sure you're not trapping any beetles in there and at this point, you're probably getting a little late for that. Um, yeah, that's just kind of keep up with the management and, and hopefully over time um, they'll go down. And, and insect populations are cyclical. We've kind of got um, booms and busts with them. So we may be high for a year or two and then they'll, they'll kind of tail off after a while. So 
we'll just have to see if it stays nice and dry this year and you know august and july and stuff when they're laying eggs we'll probably see fewer a lot of it's going to be weather dependent too yeah because that female she's really after when she's looking for an egg laying site she wants turf grass warm sunny spot but good moisture level in that soil right yeah so if you're if you're irrigating your turf you're causing your own problems <laughs> so to speak because they like that <laughs> that nice moist environment so if you let your grass go dormant uh, it's a lot less attractive to them yes yes I, I was walking by uh scouting the garden as as we should be doing uh scouting early in the morning and um i walked by my dahlias i have them in some pots and i just put them out wherever in the garden kind of nestled in amongst some ornamental grass and i look down and i see this ball of Japanese beetles and they're all mating. It's just giant sex ball of Japanese beetles. They're not feeding yet, but I know they, in the past, they have eaten my dahlias in the past. So I know it's a matter of time. They're having fun, but they're gonna want a salad after that. So I just took my hand and I just smacked the, this <laughs> ball of beetles off. Haven't seen them since. So um, as Ken said, get that early control so that they don't feed on those plants and release those those uh, pheromones that attract more of them. So yeah, Ken, I've, I've seen them on on strawberries this year in our garden. Mm -hmm. I haven't typically seen that, um, which is interesting. Yeah, we've got them on our our cotton. Uh, some of them on our cone flowers. Our raspberries are starting to get chewed up pretty good now too. So. I learn new plants every year that they feed on. So strawberries is new. Ferns for me last year, I think it was was a Boston fern. I saw them like devouring, and I'm like, I've never seen anything eat a fern. And here is the Japanese beetle eating a fern. So that was wild to see that. I don't even know if deer eat ferns. I'm sure they do. <laughs> deer eat everything, but um, yeah. So uh, Ken, I'm wondering uh, another question that I commonly get is for large shade trees. Um, like when I was walking underneath my Norway maple the other day, I felt all these little black things pelting me and I look at I look at my hand I'm like oh this looks like insect frass and I look up and the leaves are skeletonized way up in the top canopy it's Japanese beetle poop that's raining down on me is there anything that we can be doing with our shade trees to help them yeah so you could put like a systemic uh, on those trees at, at this point you're probably a little late you want to do that earlier in the year uh, so the tree can take up that insecticide and move it throughout the tree uh, a lot of times with with shade trees, though, you see a lot with lindens and stuff. They'll feed on them, but they still come back um, the next year. They're they're coming out a little bit later in the year, so it's not as big of a concern. Uh, some of that feeding damage. Trees produce more leaves than they need, so they can stand to lose um, some here and there. So things like maple, you could put a systemic down early in the year, but you know any, anything else feeding on there, you're going to kill it too. So you know we with a lot of people interested in pollinators you know we're putting out pollinator plants a lot of caterpillars and stuff will feed on on some of these trees that we may be trying to manage japanese beetles for but those caterpillars eating that mm -hmm. those leaves that have that insecticide are going to be affected too so you, you kind of have to balance that and if you wanted to you could use the systemic but if you want to be a little more live and let live you probably want to avoid that and if it's a large tree you're probably as a homeowner probably not going to have the equipment to get the top canopy, which is where they typically start feeding for Japanese beetles and work their way down um, to spray that yourself. So you could also have a <clears throat> um, landscape company or something come out and spray those mm -hmm. um, foliar spray if you wanted to. Yeah, I and I, I'm in the same kind of boat. I'm like, I don't really care. Well, one, I don't care about uh, Norway maple. So <laughs> <laughs> they could eat it if they want it. Um, but so... Uh, but yeah, the systemics, uh, that is an option, makes the plant poisonous to any insect that feeds on it, as Ken mentioned, could be our native caterpillars that are feeding on, uh, say, a native oak tree or a native maple tree. And so just got to figure that out. But there are some products like um, uh, containing imidacloprid, or the systemic products that you put on the soil and the tree takes it up and makes it all poisonous to everything. Um, it's labeled not to be applied to lindens. Is that still in effect yeah this, the stuff i've seen yeah because lindens are blooming when japanese beetles are coming out mm -hmm. um and yeah. that there's a potential for that insecticide to make it into the, the nectar or the pollen so, yeah. and usually you want to you need to put those out several weeks before your pest is coming out a lot of times yeah 
So assist your tree in recovery in that case, wide mulch rings, water during drought, um, and making sure that you're pruning appropriately and at the right time of year. So for oaks, ideally, we're going to be doing that in the wintertime. Most of our other shade trees can be pruned most of the other most times a year, but just prune correctly. Don't leave stubs and don't do flush cuts. So Ken, there is a sample that came into my office that is very often confused with Japanese beetle. I've also had it called emerald ash borer, but it is this guy. Let's see if my blur works. And I'll post a better picture here, folks, if you're watching us on YouTube. Um, this is a fairly large beetle. I mean, it's like a little bigger than my thumbnail. Uh, it's green, has this coppery color to it. Uh, I would say that it is significantly larger than a Japanese beetle, um, almost double in size. Ken, what do I have right here? So it looks like it's a, a green June beetle, or mm -hmm. some people call them fig eaters. Um, so they, those can be uh, can be issues on, on fruit trees. Sometimes you hear about them, especially like your stone fruit peaches and things like that, uh, getting onto them uh, and, and feeding on them. Now, one cool thing about those is that the larvae actually crawl around on their back. Um, so if you see a larva upside down crawling around, it's probably the larva of one of those guys. The green June beetle. Oh, well, I think they're really neat. I've never really had an issue with them. I guess, as, as you mentioned, they can congregate on some fruit trees and things and cause problems. So same control recommendations, though, for them and Japanese beetles. Yeah, and then I'd say they're probably more of an occasional. If, if you're not having, if you don't have fruit trees, you're probably not going to have to worry about them and <clears throat> if you do yeah you'll know it when, when you get them well can to move away from insects that eat everything and to insects that eat everything within the cucurbit family um the insect that makes me never want to grow any cukes again squash bug um, I am scouting. I see their egg masses on leaves. And normally I, I like lift up the leaf. I see them on the underside. I see them on the underside, on the top. I see them on the stem. I'm like, and I'm smashing them. I'm doing it. I'm trying to keep after them as best I can. I have, I have seen the nymphs and I smash those as well. I haven't seen an adult yet. So maybe I'm doing a pretty good job at just like mechanical control with my thumbnail. Mm -hmm. Um, but squash bugs, can, tell us about squash bugs um, and 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 just help me become really angry right now. Yeah, because I'm getting really <laughs> mad just talking about them. Yeah, so like you mentioned, they'll lay their eggs all over the plant. Usually yeah, you see them on the leaves, on underside leaves, kind of where the veins meet in those notches a lot of times. Or on the stems, they kind of have a brick red, brownish red uh, color to them. They're usually laid in clusters. So going out scouting, flipping over leaves, looking for those egg clusters and smashing them pulling off that section of the leaf um, and disposing it. Just don't take off the part of the leaf and throw it on the ground because they're still going to be there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and those will eventually hatch when they come out. The larva or the nymphs are going to be green and black. And as they age, they'll get kind of gray in color and eventually turn brown um, as adults. With all insects, the, the, the nymphs and the larva are easier to control than the adults. That's particularly true for squash bug. Um, a lot of the chemicals, the chemicals that you're using as a homeowner don't really do much, if anything, to the adults. So if you are going to be spraying for them, you want to get on that as soon as they start showing up um, to try to get rid of those before they can mature. And they'll, they've will they got the piercing sucking mouth parts, kind of like a straw, so they'll stick that into the plant and suck out juices. They'll get on uh, fruit. Uh, one year, forgot to get one of the pumpkins we were growing out of the garden. It went out there and you can barely see the rind anymore. There's so many squash bugs because we had pulled all the plants. Um, it's kind of cool looking, but I, I wouldn't be too excited if I actually wanted that pumpkin. But yes, so they can, you're they selling can cause that pumpkin. Yeah, they can cause quite a bit of damage. They can, you know, cause wilting and, you know, they're getting on the on the fruit, your pumpkins, your squash, whatever. You know, they're all that feeding holes that opens up entry areas for pathogens to get in. So you can start getting rots uh, and stuff in there. So, yeah, so for, for management, going out, scouting, picking them off, if you start seeing um, the nymphs and stuff, there's not too many, you can smush them. But if you've got a lot of, you got a lot of plants, you probably want to start looking at spraying. You can, when you're done growing um, in the fall, do a good job cleaning up your plant debris. They'll overwinter in that plant debris and stuff. So good, good sanitation with that. Uh, during the growing season, you can put out boards uh, or something like that in your garden and they'll congregate under there. 
at night and you can go out in the morning and and dispatch of them um, however you wish whether that's smushing or spraying <laughs> um, but kind of give them that hiding spot then you can go out and, and destroy them uh, and stuff so and you could also use things like early in the year uh, you could try things like floating row covers or something on them uh, to try to keep those adults off off of them so they don't lay eggs um, but once your plants start vining and then flowering you're going to have to take those off unless you're going to hand pollinate all of your squash mm -hmm. which if you only have one plant you could probably do but probably get a little tedious if you've got several plants yeah i i would say most of the time i typically recommend a liquid formulation when it comes to an insecticide um and to be very careful when you are applying that around flowers because um even this just morning this morning i was out uh very early and i looked down and spending the night inside that flower was i believe a squash bee yeah. um so a pollinator and so if you are applying an insecticide, yes, we want to try to keep our plants alive so that they can produce pumpkin or zucchini or whatever it is. Uh, but we also want to make sure that we keep the pollinators around because we need them to do the pollination or you're out there with a Q-tip or a toothbrush, as Ken described, pollinating yourself. So uh, pollen or insects, uh, insecticide applications in the evening. Uh, useful, be careful of flowers, because uh, there's probably might be a bee spending the night in there. And um, again, in the evening, fewer of our insects are active. It also does give you a little bit more residual control because we don't have the UV light breaking it down as quickly. So um, it is it also beneficial in that regard, especially if you decide to go with an organic product because organic products, and they see the sunlight, the uv light and they just start breaking down immediately it's like ah sunlight i have to no longer be here because i'm organic compound and that's what uv light does to organic compounds so um just keep that in mind an evening application really really useful not only for minimizing damage to our pollinators and beneficials gives you a little bit extra residual so yeah and another thing if if you've got plants you're going to be spraying you can take those flowers off mm -hmm. um they're going to be close to opening or, or have opened um that may have bees in them you could if you've got enough plants, you can maybe spray half one night, take those flowers off, and then a day or two later, remove the flowers from the other plants and spray so you're not potentially having that <clears throat> residual on those those flowers. They're going to be opening up that next day. Yeah. Now, I made that same suggestion to someone on Japanese beetles, and they had them all over their roses. And I said, just, just prune off all your flowers if you really intend on spraying to control these beetles. And the person on the phone, they... Uh, probably thought I was crazy. They're like, what are you talking about? Cut my rose flowers off that. Why would I do that? <laughs> it's like, well, well, you know, explaining about pollinators and they're going to be attracting insects. And um, so I think I might've convinced them like, Hey, if I prune all my rose flowers off, I'll spray, I'll kill the Japanese beetles and there'll be a new flush of growth. Cause these were knockouts, you know, they don't mm -hmm. stop blooming. So um, yeah, yeah, that is a good strategy. And your squash flowers are edible. So have a salad with some squash flowers on it. Just eat them. Deep fried squash flour. <laughs> that sounds good. That's what makes something healthy, not healthy. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Ken, I gotta, I gotta say, I was uh scouting, as we all should be doing, um, getting my head right down there in the plants, and I came across this beautiful red, brown, clear-winged moth, and she was just sitting on the leaves. What the heck was that? On your cucurbits, on my yeah, on my zucchini actually, yeah. And it's probably your your squash vine borer, which I have also seen. I, I was out scouting and I probably got a lot more excited than I should have mm -hmm. <laughs> to see mm -hmm. one flying around. But yes, so those are out and about now, and I'm actually doing our blog post for this week is going to be on squash vine borers. So I don't know if we can give too much away. You may have to just read that and, and I think find out for yourself. I think, folks, you just need to go check out the Good Growing blog at go.illinois.edu slash goodgrowing, because if you haven't seen the blog yet, you don't, you're not living the high uh, uh, felicity gardening life. Is that a thing? High or is that a movie title? High fidelity? I don't know what I'm saying. Hang on. Let's back this train up. Um, Where's Katie? Where is Katie? Katie, come back. Uh I don't know what's happening right now. You're not here to correct us. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have anyone to keep us in check. We're, we're falling apart at the seams here. So, well, that, that sounds like a good spot to end it then on the high felicity, <laughs> fidelity, 
high society. That's what I was trying to come up with. High society gardening, good growing by high society. I don't, that, that is not a thing. So it, it's just a good <laughs> blog with good information on it to keep you growing. Good. <laughs> well, uh, that was a lot of great information about some of the bugs attacking our gardens this, the, this time of year. Uh, next week, we will be back with a Garden Bite episode, I do believe. Um, so this week, the Good Growing Podcast is edited by me, Chris Enroth. Special thanks to Ken. Thanks, Ken, for sticking around with me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sticking around with me. <laughs> <laughs> and Katie, we miss you. So uh, best yeah. wishes in, in your next job. And um, please buy us uh, lunch next time we see you. Well, Ken, now what do you do? Who am I thanking Ah, listeners. Oh, that's right. Thank you for what you do, Bess. Thanks for listening. Gracious. If you're watching us on YouTube, watching. And as always, keep on growing. What he said. That's great. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> All right. Yeah. That was good. We got it. I'm using that one. <laughs> <laughs>